The writers of the U.S. Constitution contemplated that state governments would act as a check and balance on the federal system. The Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified as a part of the Bill of Rights on December 15, 1791, as it simply states, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. States are the laboratories for democracy. People have more confidence in their state governments than in the federal government. But states must retain their influence and protect state primacy. More and more these days, you hear of federal overreach, but are the states doing all that they can? Have states co-opted their power to gain more federal funding? Our next speaker is going to talk to us about the new federalism and what these regulations are costing. Senator Mark Norris was first elected Majority Leader of the Tennessee Senate on January 10, 2007. He came to the state in 2000 as a Republican County Commissioner from rural Shelby County. He was reelected in 2004 and is the first Republican in state history elected to represent Dyer County in the Tennessee General Assembly. In 2008, he was successfully elected for a third term. Currently, he serves as the chairman of the Senate Rules Committee and is a member of the Finance, Ways, and Means Committee and the State and Local Government Committee. Senator Norris received his law degree from the University of Denver College of Law in 1980, and immediately on receiving his degree, he began practicing in Tennessee. He serves as special counsel to the law firm of Adams and Reese. Senator Norris is the 2014 chairman of the Council of State Governments and selected federalism as his topic of emphasis during his tenure. He is a member of the Southern States Energy Board's Executive Committee. Let's welcome Senator Mark Norris. I always wanted him to do that for me. You know, I've been, I've been on the Southern States Energy Board for many years, and um, I was just angling for a, an opportunity to be here at the podium, right? It's appropriate that we're in the moonlight room um, because I traveled by moonlight to get here. And it's sort of a perfect metaphor in a lot of ways for um, this year I'm having as chairman of the Council of State Governments. For, for a few of you who may not know, CSG is, is all 50 states. Um, but all three branches of government in each state. So we've got the executive and judicial as well as the legislative. And I guess Earl Ray, who spoke yesterday, Governor Tomlin is not here, at least I can't see him through the lights, but um, Earl Ray is CSG's president, and that's the, that's the protocol. We have a legislator serve as chair and a governor serve as uh, president. Next year we'll have Governor Sandoval of Nevada, uh, and Carl Marcelino will be our, our chair uh, from New York, Senator Carl Marcelino. Now, I mention that um, because I'm just sort of he home here with you. I'm not going to give a big highfalutin speech. Uh, that's kind of intimidated me a little bit. You gave a little bit of my speech already on federalism. But I just want to share some, some thoughts and, and observations with you and talk about um, perhaps a, a new alternative. You all have had some conversation here about regulation freedom. Um, if you've seen my friend Roman Bueller, you no doubt have rapidly gone the other way. That's a joke. I say that to Roman all the time. Um, one of, one of the, the best versed scholars in federalism and uh, regulatory overreach in the nation. Um, and I give him a hard time because he is driven by this issue. Each of you have at your places here an article that um, was co-authored by my colleague, Senator Douglas Henry in the Tennessee Senate, known to many of you as, as our uh, guardian of federalism. He served for over 40 years, an esteemed Democrat, so it's a bipartisan piece um, that you have. And, before Senator Sessions gets here, 
thanks for putting me right in between, you know, Bill and Senator Sessions, where I'm here talking about that nasty federal government. I'll talk fast because I don't think he's in the room yet. Uh, it's a new idea. It's, a, it's, a, it's an alternative that perhaps we can use to motivate, to inspire uh, those in the United States Senate and the House of Representatives to, um, into action. Now, it's also a perfect metaphor to be in the moonlight room because I left, uh, I guess I was in Long Beach working on Veterans Affairs, um, then to Reno um, just yesterday and the day before with NCSL. I had to go to Portland, Oregon last night to catch a flight to Atlanta so that I could catch the flight to Mobile. And um, it's all about coast to coast, and it's all about the United States, and it's all about federalism. Um, it's been a fascinating year to have the, the opportunity to um, visit so many states, and my colleagues, I see John Reagan is down here. He was hoping I wouldn't make it so he could get up here and talk about our new energy plan in Tennessee. Um, but it has given me a very unique um, perspective on the federal system that we have. Um, the, the, the integral relationship of the states to the federal government, the incidents where we have gone to Washington, D.C. and taken high-ranking state officials with us, uh, speakers, uh, leaders, and others, and, and have really been treated rather shabbily in Washington, like we're just other lobbyists showing up, some other special interest group, as though we're incidental to the federal system rather than integral to it. I won't belabor that particular story. I will say just the opposite of what I anticipated. We had, we had an appointment with the White House, David Agnew and company, uh, with Harry Reid and with Eric Cantor. And so being the Republican I am, I anticipated we'd be blown off basically by the White House. We'd get a few minutes with Harry Reid and then we'd spend most of our time with Eric Cantor. Wrong. Just the opposite. Harry Reid wouldn't see us. <laughs> Eric Cantor's office welcomed us into the conference room. A fella came in and said, I'm not Eric Cantor, I'm his chief of staff. I'm here to tell you that the leader will not be able to meet with you this morning. You're stuck with me. We don't have 30 minutes as scheduled. You only have five. And I said at this point, why? He said, because Mr. Cantor has a caucus meeting in this conference room in six minutes. That was the attitude. The White House, on the other hand, we had 20 minutes scheduled, and they, they kept us there for an hour and 10 minutes. And we actually had good dialogue about some of the things I want to talk with you about today. I um, had a particularly good time in the state of Illinois. We give our friends in Illinois, do we have anybody here from from Illinois today. Don't be bashful. I won't be harsh. <laughs> I've made a lot of good friends. Uh, John Cullerton is the Senate president in, in Illinois. I'm sure some of you know him. And um, uh, we could not be much different in terms of our political philosophies. Um, I went up there for a meeting and got in the cab and we decided to double down and so I swung around to pick him up. He got in the car and he was just, he was just giddy with delight. I, I said, well, how did your session go? He said, it was the best session ever. He said, we, we raised the income tax. We put a constitutional right to abortion in, in, our, in our constitution and, and we really cracked down on handguns. And I'm not kidding, I'm from Tennessee. We, we currently have two resolutions pending for constitutional amendments, that, that there is no constitutional right per se to an abortion, but the people and the legislature get to decide. Um, we are a big Second Amendment right state. I mean, we're debating open carry now. Um, and we have a Second Amendment, um, not a Second Amendment, but a second resolution for a constitutional amendment right now to, to forever ban an income tax, 180 degrees difference. Uh, he looked like I'd hit him with a baseball bat when I told him that, but I said that's why everybody's leaving Illinois and moving to Tennessee. <laughs> Illinois' state motto 
given that, that paradigm, interestingly, is state sovereignty and national union. And isn't that a beautiful thing? I mean, that epitomizes what we're here to talk about a little bit. Um, the strength of the states in our federal system um, and how they are threatened by this regulatory overreach. I want to digress for a minute. There's Mullis. <laughs> I already said hi to Harry. He's trying to take our water. Let's see, this is great stuff going on in the states. Georgia, Tennessee, not, I know, and I see you guys are not sitting where either one of you can reach each other. Um, but I've got to set a little bit of background here, if I can, for a minute, because it's one thing, as we have done in Little Rock, we had a great meeting, Southern States Energy Board, talking about the EPA, the new proposed uh, groundwater regulations, way down in the weeds on that stuff, and we're, I'd be preaching to the choir to get into it. But the backdrop, first of all, is about basically at least one generation of, of what I call civic illiterates in this country. Um, I've been fortunate to work with Sandra Day O'Connor, Justice O'Connor, the last several years on trying to reintroduce the teaching of civics and American history um, in, our, in our schools. And I don't know how many of you have given that up or how many of you are teaching those essential courses today, um, but there aren't nearly enough. It took me six years to reinstitute the teaching of civics in Tennessee. Um, Americans show great uncertainty, as you know, when it comes to answering basic questions. I looked uh, at Constitution Day recently, September 17th. We celebrated the anniversary of the signing of our Constitution, and a study was released. 1,416 adults, um, while little more than a third of the respondents could name all three branches of the U.S. government, just as many could not name even one branch of our government. Just over a quarter of Americans, it was 27 percent, uh, know that it takes two-thirds vote of the House and Senate to override a presidential veto. One in five Americans, or 21 percent, incorrectly thinks that a 5-4 Supreme Court decision is sent to Congress for reconsideration. Okay? It's against this type of backdrop that we have uh, federal regulatory overreach, encroachment on our basic rights. And if you don't know that you have those rights to begin with, you don't know that they're being taken away. Recent studies show that the United States ranked 139th in voter participation out of 172 world democracies. 139th out of 172 with only 24% of graduating high school seniors scoring proficient or advanced in civics as recently as, as 2010, just 24%. Fewer than 70% of high school seniors reported learning about important parts of civic knowledge in 2010, including the United States Constitution, Congress, or the court system. And college seniors scored only 54% correct answers on a test measuring civic knowledge. Justice Kennedy has said recently that the case for freedom for our constitutional principles, the case for our heritage has to be made anew in each generation because the work of freedom is never done. And in this context, remember the words of James Madison, you've heard them before, but there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. Ladies and gentlemen, when you think about what is taking place with regulatory overreach, look at the slides I'm going to show here momentarily. Uh, Ken was very kind to mention our focus on federalism. Um, I have more statistics that I put out in a, in a report about the cost of uh, regulations and unfunded mandates. But the Chamber of Commerce has issued this report, and again, because we've talked about, we've beaten the topic to death, but I didn't know how many of you might have seen this at the Chamber of Commerce. I'm going to give you a second to look at these self-explanatory slides, but particularly figure one, 
picture's worth a thousand words. Again, if you remember that the vast majority of citizens in the United States don't have any idea that this is going on. They don't know what they're losing. They don't know what they're giving up. Billions of dollars worth of additional costs. Now, to be sure, and Bill would, would agree, I mean, some regulation is necessary. It's not as though all regulations would go away. But the extent to which we are regulated and the, the lack of ability of the United States Congress or, or desire or willingness to do their job and weigh in on these is very troublesome. Our friends at the EPA loom large. I don't think Mr. Johnson would disagree with that by comparison to the others. And you can, again, they speak for themselves. Now, I suppose I could say, oh, look, we're making progress down here in 2013. Look how the, look how the cost of EPA rules has gone down. Well, once they codify the EPA, the new Clean Water Act regs, bar the door. Had any of you seen the Chamber's presentation on this? I, I wanted to give you something just a little bit new and different. Now, the Chamber has these five recommendations, but I've highlighted two of them here. Uh, how to get at, in a meaningful way, remedying this problem. Congress has to provide clear legislative standards, et cetera. But here at the bottom, Citizens must be allowed to participate in the regulatory process. Citizens must be welcomed into the regulatory process by being given access to all of the information used by agencies to make decisions and given the right to challenge agency data and decisions, rights they don't have today. Now, not necessarily literally, but through their elected representatives. Uh, we think that a very strong case can be made that we should be able to hold our members of the House and our senators to this standard that they assume responsibility, or at least more so, for enacting these regulations. And that's where regulatory freedom comes in. I put this here. The, the RAINS Act is referenced. I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with the RAINS Act. Anybody here familiar with it? It was, a, it was uh, Senator Rand Paul's um, legislation, which I understand they are running again, along with Virginia Fox's uh, UMITA, the Unfunded Mandate Act, uh, both of which previously passed the House, uh, but not the Senate. Senator Sessions isn't here yet. But it sort of gives you the, the, the RAINS Act, the acronym is Regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny. Okay? It hasn't advanced. Uh, UMITA, I don't know whether it will advance. Um, most people are skeptical that it will. So the article you have in front of you uh, is reproduced here. It sets forth the very simple language of the Regulation Freedom Act or constitutional amendment. But I say or because that's not necessarily the end game. It is possible that the states could call for a constitutional convention. I know that's controversial in some circles, but what we've been talking about is the same process that was used, quite frankly, to force the passage of the Bill of Rights. Yes, the states could do this. They could. And as states increasingly fall into line and the number gets up to that magic number, 34. Um, odds are that our friends in Congress and in the Senate would say, you know, we'd really rather not have it go this way. Let us take care of it. Whenever one quarter of the members of the U.S. House or the U.S. Senate transmit to the President their written declaration of opposition to a proposed federal regulation, it shall require a majority vote of the House and Senate to adopt that regulation. There's an elegant simplicity to it, and I don't mean a sophomoric simplicity. I think it is something that attracts a number of constituencies, whether it's the coal industry, whether it's labor unions, 
uh, whether it's the NRA, um, it's bipartisan, and it's across just about every sector uh, that you can imagine. Now, we did in Tennessee pass a delegate loyalty statute um, in the event that, that the Constitutional Convention ever became the option. But that's not really the point of what we're trying to talk about here. Um, if you require that Congress approve major new regulations, we believe it would attract liberals and conservatives, independents and Democrats, as well as Republicans, and motivate the corporate grassroots as well as citizens to end the kind of regulatory abuse that is really holding this nation back. I know you've had presentations on, on coal, the number of coal plants that have been shut down uh, just recently. Um, it's a huge problem, and we've got to issue a wake-up call. So far, we have two governors, um, more than at last count, Roman, if I recall, 140 state legislators, um, including nine state house speakers and Senate presidents, majority leaders, um, my colleagues, uh, the general counsel of the Republican National Committee, uh, three former general counsels there, are now all supporting this approach. And again, it's designed to motivate um, a response by Congress. They don't have to have a constitutional convention. They could do this um, by federal statute. If they couldn't do it by federal statute, they could call their own convention to put it in the Constitution, all very far away from a state-initiated constitutional convention. But it's all designed to end regulation without representation. Who better to do it than the folks we sent to D.C.? So we think that empowering states to force Congress to act is, is, a, is viable. It's a valuable new strategy for limiting governmental abuse. Um, it should be added to our toolkit just the way uh, it takes, you know, 60 votes in the Senate to, to pass laws or put spending restrictions on bills. They could have the same requirement through this type of approach. And, you know, we talk about James Madison, we talk about the other, the founders, uh, lofty quotes, but in the context we've discussed here today, think about Ronald Reagan. I mean, you've heard it a million times, but his quote that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It's not passed on to our children in the bloodstream. It has to be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same, or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States when men were free. I'll be happy to answer any questions. I know it's probably not what you're expecting, but you all are experts, and you know this stuff. Thank you for that. <laughs>